we have some folks here who are a lot more adept in the uh, world of gardening than I am. I not only don't have a green thumb, I have a black thumb. Any time that I've ever tried to plant a garden or have a garden, it hadn't ended very well. Certainly not with vegetables to eat and things of that nature. I have lived in a place one time though where the guy that was there before me had uh, planted a garden and uh, <laughs> that next summer, our first summer there, stuff started just sprouting up out of the ground. And I was mowing and just mowed over the top of it, didn't know what it was or whatever. And someone told me, hey, that's lettuce. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> that, that'll work. So anyway, so I'm talking to you about gar a gardening topic this evening, but uh, it, it's, it's coming from here, okay? So you, you can trust it, you know, uh, I mean, you know, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. But uh, the fig tree was the most valuable of all trees. It was naturally a very productive tree. In fact, it, uh, it uh, bore three crops each year. Normally, it was in fruit. 10 out of the 12 months of the year, with what we would consider to be, to be April and May being the only exceptions. Because of this, fig trees were often planted among the vines. Because that way, if the vines failed, which sometimes they did, uh, the, the uh, owner would, was sure to have figs to harvest, and the season wouldn't be a total waste, and it, it wouldn't be a total, a total loss. Now, under normal circumstances, a fig tree, once it was planted, it would take three years for it to bear its first fruit. And then, like I said, after that, it was almost every month, 10 out of the 12 months of the year, you could look to that tree, and you would find fruit on it. You'd find figs on it. Well, in Luke 13... Verses 6 through 9. Jesus tells a parable about a fig tree. And a lot of times when Jesus tells a parable, it's about a person. But this one's about a fig tree. And let, let's see what he has to say. Looking at Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I, have not, and I have find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The point of the parable is that the owner waited the required three years. In fact, some would say that based on how this reads, not only had he waited three years since he planted it to, to uh, look for fruit on it, but he had gone an additional three years. That it was uh, the three years and then it was the first time he looked on it and it didn't have it. And then he waited three more years for, to, to find fruit on this, uh, on this fig tree. Um, and he hadn't found any. And so his response is probably the response that we would have if we had a plant in a garden uh, or a tree in a garden that wasn't producing fruit. Cut it down. Pl plant another one that will, that will bear fruit. So, but the gardener interceded on the tree's behalf for just one more chance. What does this parable mean? I mean, that's a, that's a fair question. What, 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 what is Jesus' point? What's he, what is he teaching here, both to the original audience that heard it from Jesus' own lips and from, and from our standpoint? What's the message for us? Context is so very important. Anytime that you are looking at Scripture, you need to know the proper context because if you take a verse and you remove it from its proper context, you can get from it, in some instances, not only not the correct meaning, but the opposite meaning that the, that the word should have had when, when, you, when you looked at it. So putting this verse in the context, this parable in the context, we need to know what Jesus is talking about. 
So if we look back at verses 1 through 5 of Luke chapter 13, we find out what Jesus was, was talking about, what the discussion was. It says, There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This parable is about repentance. That, that, that's what he's talking about in, in the parable of the fig tree. Let's look first at the immediate meaning. What did this parable mean to the Jews who heard it from Jesus' own mouth? What, what did it mean when they heard it for the first time? And they're, they're following up this discussion about, uh, about these Galileans and the people in Jerusalem when the Tower of Siloam fell on them and everything. So what, 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 uh, what did this mean to those people who heard Jesus say it? Well, for them it meant that with Jesus, the time of final opportunity had come. Uh, time and again, the Jews are warned about Jesus being their last chance to repent. In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, John the Baptist says this, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It was John's belief, and this is what he's warning the people about, that with the coming of Jesus, an hour of destiny had come. That with the coming of Jesus, an hour uh, that they had been waiting for, and it was their last chance. Later in Matthew chapter 12, verses 41 and 42, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, Jesus says, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Israel had had chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who was prophesied to come. To hear the voice of God and to accept the offer of God. Chance after chance after chance after chance. It had come with the law of Moses. It had come during the period of the judges many times. It had come during the period of the kings, not with the kings themselves, but with the prophets that were there were sent to warn the kings about the, the disastrous path that the vast majority of them were taking. And it had finally come in the Son of God. Just as the fig tree was to receive one last chance, so Israel was to receive one last chance, one final opportunity to take God's way. The coming of Jesus was a last chance for uh, this very simple reason that God could do no more. It was impossible for God to make a more urgent appeal. It was impossible for God to make a more emotional appeal, a more moving appeal than in sending His very Son, a part of Himself. To reject Jesus was finally to reject God. Because beyond Jesus, God could, God's appeal could not go. So for the immediate audience that hears Jesus say these words... It's the fact that the, with Jesus, the time of final opportunity had come. But the same is true for us today. Jesus is our last chance at salvation. You see, with Jesus, a pattern was established. When Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and rose from the grave, never to die again, a pattern was established uh, that would ensure that when we rise from the dead, it will be 
never to die again, but to live with Him for all of eternity. And unless we conform to the pattern, unless, uh, if, if, then uh, we have rejected Jesus. We've rejected God. We've rejected our last chance at spending eternity with them in heaven. We must conform to that pattern of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So with the immediate lesson of the parable uh, having to do with Jesus being their last chance for the Jews, and that, for that matter for us as well, the parable contains many general lessons as well. So let's look at some of the general lessons that we can learn from this. First of all, the fig tree was useless. Okay? I mean, I don't know if you got that out of, out of the parable, but I think it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, blatant from the, the, uh, the parable. The fig tree was absolutely useless. And uselessness invites disaster. Because the fig tree was useless, it was threatened with destruction. Because it wouldn't produce figs, it was going to be cut down. The ultimate test of any man or woman is of what use are they in the world to God? How can God use you? How, can, uh, how will you allow yourself to be used by God? That's the ultimate test of, 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 of a man or a woman. Now, don't misunderstand. Usefulness does not necessarily mean doing the quote-unquote big things. You know, it is quite possible to be of the greatest use by doing what looks like the littlest of things. Seemingly insignificant things. Seemingly things that are beneath some of the people who do some of the bigger, more important things. For example, think about the story of the widow's might, Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Do you remember the story? Jesus is watching the people as they come by, putting in their offering, their tithes, into the temple treasury and people are coming by with lots and lots of money and putting it into the the treasury and all and then a little widow comes with two very small copper coins worth less than a penny and she puts those in and when she does Jesus says to his disciples she put in more than all the others and you know what the disciples don't get it Big surprise, right? I mean, they don't understand what he's talking about. And so Jesus explains to them that the rich gave out of their wealth, but that she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live in, live on. Two mites, seemingly so small, yet paid great dividends for that widow. How does that relate for us, to us today? Well, sometimes we think that the only way to serve God is to do the really big things. To uh, preach in a public assembly of the church. To lead singing or to say a prayer or to wait on the table or, or to do all these other leadership type things. And we think that that's the only way that, you can, that we can serve God. We fail to realize that there are so many other ways that we can serve God. That what what we do here on Sunday is just a small portion of how we serve God. I mean, you may not be able to say a prayer publicly for whatever reason, but maybe you have the ability to talk to somebody that you've never met before and just, you know, carry on a conversation with them and, and, and make them feel very much at ease. There are some folks who can't do that. I struggle with it, okay? I, 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 can, I, I can more intimidate people than, than make them feel at ease sometimes. But, uh, but you might be able to do that. And, and, and that may, might be a way that you can serve God. When we come together, you know, you find the visitors that are here and you, you talk to them and you help them feel at ease, help them to feel welcomed here. Even the guy that was here this morning with the Mississippi State tie. Okay, did y'all notice he had a Mississippi State tie? You know, he was here for some football game or something. I don't know. I bet he was disappointed that there wasn't much of a game. But that's another story for another time. The point is that no matter where they come from, they need to feel welcome. 
And we need to understand that. And that may be your ministry. That may be the way that you can serve God. And just because you're not standing up here on the stage doing something doesn't mean that your ministry isn't important. It doesn't mean that, the, that you're not serving God. So whatever your talent is, even if it's not the most quote-unquote glamorous form of service, it is service. And if that is a talent that God has blessed you with, then you need to use it to His glory and not be ashamed of it because the person with whatever your talent is is just as important to God as the person who delivers the sermon or who leads the singing or who waits on the table or who says the prayers or whatever else happens up here on this stage. It's important. The important thing is not to think of yourself as useless because if you think you're useless, then you probably are. And uselessness invites disaster. So the fig tree was useless. That created its problems. Not only was the fig tree useless though, but the fig tree was a burden to the ground. Did you catch what the uh, owner of the vineyard said here? He said, uh, it, it, why should it use up the ground? The fig tree was using up the nutrients of the ground without putting anything back. Uh, taking up space that could have been given to something useful and it was not it was using up nourishment without making any return, without contributing anything. It wasn't producing figs. It was just using up the soil, using up the nutrients that were in the soil. And uh, uh, because of that, it was going to be cut down. Here we come perhaps indirectly, but quite definitely, on one of the most fundamental aspects of Jesus' teachings about life. You see, for Jesus... Goodness was always a positive thing. Now, a lot of times you talk to people, and as you're talking to them, uh, perhaps about sal <laughs> salvation, excuse me, <coughs> or about their soul, a lot of times one of the most popular comebacks that they, they say is, well, I never did anything to anyone. In other words, I, I haven't hurt anybody. So I must be okay. The one who claims this seems to think that not doing wrong is the same thing as doing right. See, the question Jesus asks is not, what have you not done? The question Jesus asks is, what have you done? See, it's always a positive thing. We're living in a world where the tendency is to try to extract more and more reward for less and less work. Yeah, have you figured that out? That's pretty much the society and the culture in which we live. This is not an economic problem. It's not a problem for the government to solve. It's a heart problem. It's a moral problem. It is a religious problem. If we could once again start making people understand that, uh, you know, that God is God and he should be respected as God and that in God's word he says things like if a man doesn't work he shouldn't eat and things of that nature, then maybe we could uh, turn this thing around. Each individual would understand that it is their Christian duty to put more into life than they take out. That's what this tree was doing. It was taking more out of life than it was giving back. And what Jesus wants us to do is give more back than we take in and take out of life. Third, the fig tree failed to realize its own possibilities. And that's why it was in danger. As I mentioned earlier, the fig tree had in its capabilities the ability to be the most fruitful of trees. In this tree's case, it had a special opportunity because it was planted among the vines in the great soil of a vineyard. It really should have produced many, many figs instead of nothing. But the tree remained fruitless, and because of this, it was in danger of condemnation. You know, the most common word for sin in the New Testament, in the Greek language, is a shooting term. What it means is to miss the target. Not only do you not hit a bull, the bullseye, but you don't even hit the, hit the target. I mean, if, if you, have you ever been shooting arrows or, or a gun or whatever, and you're shooting at a target and you totally miss it? 
That's what this word means. It means yeah, uh, missing everything. Failing to meet a standard. It's similar to a young boy who was born into a wealthy family. And when he was born, everybody that saw him said, oh, he will do great things in his life. Well, as the boy grew, out, grew older, he didn't do anything. And people began to say, well, he could do great things if he wanted to. And then when the boy reached the end of his life, they said, well, he could have, been, he could have done great things if he had only wanted to. That's what sin is. Missing a standard, failing to make the most of an opportunity, to have some opportunity, uh, ability, and make nothing of it, to ha have been able to make some contribution in life and to not have made it, to have been able to have give some, given some help to somebody, but you didn't give it to them. You withheld that help. That is sin. In fact, James chapter 4, verse 17 puts it pretty clear. Anyone who knows the good he ought to do but does not do it, sins. See, it's not a question of, of, uh, of, of can you do it. God's, God's going to give you opportunities to use the abilities that you have. God doesn't ask us to do more than we are able but he does demand that we do what is in our ability to do, and not only that, but to do it to the very best of our ability. Then finally, the fig tree failed, but it still found a champion. The fig tree failed, but it still found a champion. The gardener, the vine dresser, still believed in the tree, got the fig, fig tree another chance because he believed that, that, that the tree could produce that the tree could do what it was supposed to do, what it had in its abilities to do. It was still, that it was still capable of realizing its destiny because he believed that the fig tree could still bear fruit. Did anyone, anyone here ever fail? Anyone here ever mess up? Okay, you can be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. It's, we're all in that same boat, aren't we? Jesus is the champion of men and women, uh, but, of, but of mankind. Uh, the most significant thing about Jesus is his tremendous belief in mankind. That is proved beyond all doubt by the height of the commands that Jesus gave. No leader ever demanded so much from his followers Jesus obviously believes that we are capable of doing things that are so great. We can't even begin to imagine them. And he believes this even after we, after we let him down time and time again. Perhaps the best example of this is the Apostle Peter. I mean, no one could have hurt Jesus more. I mean, you, know, you think about that night. When Jesus was betrayed and he was taken into uh, the high priest's home and Peter followed at a distance and got into the courtyard and then people started saying, hey, you're a Galilean. You were with this guy, Jesus. He, no, I was not. Then someone else says, no, you were. You know, your accent gives you away. Just admit, no, I wasn't. Then a few minutes later, yeah, you are, and he starts calling down curses on himself and starts yelling and screaming and making a big to-do about, I don't know the man. And John's gospel, I believe, tells us the rooster crowed and Jesus turned and looked right at Peter. And you know all of the beatings and the physical harm that had happened to Jesus I think that failure of Peter hurt him more than all the other things combined. But even though it hurt him, Jesus didn't give up on Peter, did he? <laughs> uh, but after Jesus rose from the dead, Mark 16 verse 7 tells us that Jesus sent a message specifically to Peter to say, hey, I've risen from the dead and I still believe in you. 
The very fact that Jesus believes in us should fill us with a new determination not to fail him. So even though the fig tree failed, it still found a champion. The gardener still believed in the tree, but the harsh, there's a harsh reality we need to be aware of. And that is that there is a limit. After one more year, the limit came for the fig tree. If it didn't bear fruit in that one more year, then it was going to be destroyed. For us too, there is a final chance. For us too, if we continually and, and purposefully and willfully refuse to live the lives that God calls us to, eventually we're going to become incapable of living the lives that God calls us to. It, it is the law of life that says if a person fails to use a faculty, he will lose it. Someone once uh, said that if one lives long enough in the dark, they'll become blind. If, uh, if one refuses to use an arm or a leg uh, long enough, the muscles will refuse to work and the limb will become paralyzed. If one has a talent and doesn't use it, they will lose it. If a, man, if a man or a woman constantly refuses the invitation and the challenge of Christ, he can, in the end, make himself incapable of accepting it. And in such a case, it's important to understand that it was not God who condemned, the person condemned himself. This parable is an encouragement to continue to follow Christ, no matter how inadequate a job that you feel that you are doing, and you will never be shut out. Because all that tree had to do was start bearing fruit. All it had to do was start doing what it was supposed to do. And it would continue to, to, to survive. But, we can refuse, but when we refuse to make the effort, we can shut ourselves out. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son continually cleanses us from all sin. What does it mean to walk in the light? Does it mean that you never sin? No. Does it mean that you sin and you don't care because, hey, God's job is to forgive us, so it doesn't matter? No. What it means is that you're making your best effort. And when you stumble and when you fall, you get back up, you dust yourself off, and you keep on going. What about you? Are you still trying to follow Christ each and every day, each and every moment of your life? Are you willing to let Jesus have His way with you? To let Jesus determine the course for your life, the path for your life? More than just being willing to do that, have you actively taken steps to allow Him to guide the course of your life? If you haven't, now is a perfect opportunity to start. Maybe starting means that initial act of obedience by being immersed in the watery grave of baptism, have your sin, having your sins washed away, being raised to walk in newness of life. Maybe that step is to uh, maybe talk with the person sitting next to you, saying, hey, you know, I'm struggling, and I want you to pray with me, and I want you to pray for me. Maybe it involves something more public, asking the assembled church body here to pray with you and to pray for you. Whatever that need is, don't leave here with things not absolutely 100% right between you and God. And if we can help you through a public response to make things right, then won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together.